If you've ever watched an esports live stream, you probably have some idea of different organizations or esports teams. You've heard their names and maybe you wonder what exactly they are or what they do. Esports organizations are also known as multi-gaming organizations or MGOs. They house different teams and players for different titles. So imagine a Manchester United with their various football or soccer teams, depending on where you're from. So think the main team and then you've got your under 18s, etc. But instead of teams for a specific game like football or soccer, the teams and players compete in a variety of games. Have I still got you? This was a very simplified explanation. Good. Esports organizations are pretty interesting. They're celebrated globally, shrouded in controversy if you enjoy digging into random Twitter threads, and sometimes are actually nothing more than a cool logo and a one-person show pretending to be a business. As someone who works as a broadcaster in esports, I get asked about organizations a lot. How does a player get signed to one? What is the best organization to join? What should be in a contract with an organization? Before we get into this episode of Tech Girl Talks, I want to quickly remind you that I've recently announced a South African partnership with Box Gaming, a division of local ISP company Box Telecoms. I like the plan the company has to try and prioritize the needs of gamers within their network and wanted to join forces with them to try and promote greater connectivity for gamers in my home country. If you want to find out more about them, be sure to check out Box Gaming ZA on Facebook and Instagram. There's some rad content going up and it might be of interest. Okay, back to esports organizations. I really wanted this episode of Tech Girl Talks to be a one-stop listen for everything you need to know about an esports org. But I also wanted to make sure that the information could come from a strong foundation and a place of authority. There were actually only two esports organizations I was willing to have on the show. I know, biased, right? And one of them did agree to have a representative speak to me and share some information. My name is Nick Ridgway, or I go by Ashes in the esports world. And I am currently the assistant general manager for Complexity Gaming. Uh, formerly, I was a Gears of War coach and the assistant general manager for Optic Gaming, the general manager for UIU. So a lot of management and a lot of competition in this wonderful world of esports. Complexity is such a recognized and established organization in the esports space. Nick's insights is invaluable to professional players, content creators, and even smaller organization owners. In this episode, we'll get answers to almost every burning question you might ever have had about organizations. But first, I want to share a little bit more about what Nick's role in complexity entails. My day-to-day -day is a lot of taking care of our players and our different content creators, or talent, as you can call them. My job is to basically make sure that they have everything that they need so that they can be the best at whatever their goals are and accomplish those goals. So, for example, if a player needs a new controller or a content creator, uh, we want to book something with one of our content creators to do some, you know, really cool content here at the office. I kind of help facilitate all of that and make sure that everybody's on the same page, that they have everything they need, that they're happy, and overall look to uh, help complexity grow as a whole. Nick really has his hands in deep when it comes to understanding the day-to-day -day running and operations of Complexity. He has the relationships with the teams and the creators and working for an organization like Complexity means he really knows his stuff, basically. I mentioned it before, but Complexity really is one of the OGs and a highly decorated esports organization. Complexity is, uh, it's actually got a, a very long uh, history. Um, Complexity was founded in 2003 by our current CEO, Jason Lake. And we are actually, I'm here at the Star, so we are the sister esports team to the Dallas Cowboys, uh, which is really cool. I get to look out the windows and see the uh, Cowboys practice field. And uh, we are part of the Game Square esports uh, family. We have over 80 different pros and content creators. Uh, we're in tons of games like Apex Legends. We have some awesome people in Apex, a top team, uh, some amazing content creators like Ninjala and Clara. Uh, we're in Valorant, both in uh, the traditional Valorant and in uh, our women's team with GX3. Uh, we just signed this really exciting Latin American Rocket League team and a, a lot more. Some of the things that are really amazing about Complexity is uh, we put our players first and our talent first. It's uh, a mantra that's even written on the wall pretty close to my desk. And as somebody who's worked in esports for a really long time, that's always kind of been how I've conducted my business personally is I always wanted to make sure that my players that I worked with as a coach or as a manager had everything they needed. Like they were put first, they were the priority because they were the talent and they were the ones who were out there, you know, making things happen. And being able to find an org like Complexity that 
believes that as its core value and and lives that every single day, I knew I needed to be here. So it's really awesome to be with a bunch of like-minded people in this industry and complexity, you know, throughout so many different ways, they, they really showcase that they care about the talent um, or, or our pro players. So they'll, you know, provide mental health support. They, we have nutritionists who work with our players. We have fitness coaching and access to uh, actually some of the gyms here locally at the star that all of our players can use as a resource to, you know, get that kind of healthy body, healthy mind atmosphere and aspect of their gameplay. And then, you know, we, we help them out with financial literacy programs. We do media training and then just general employee benefits, which not a lot of orgs provide, you know, like 401ks, uh, health, vision, dental insurance. So when you join Complexity and you see that written on the wall that we are players first and players always, it's you, you experience that every single moment of your time here. Let's rewind for a bit. I mentioned early on about what an organization or an MGO is. Way back before competitive gaming was a business, these structures existed in an informal way, known as clans. Like-minded gamers joined different clans. There was a sense of community and support, much like what an esports organization offers now. But I do wonder if, as money has come in and bright spotlights have been pointed in the direction of esports, the same goals of community building and upliftment are centered to an organization like Complexity. Well, there's a lot of goals, and a lot of that still, you know, remains true. A lot of the the people in the office are I like to call them the old guard. You know, there Jason is here every day. He's the CEO. He's the founder. So you still have that kind of old school vibe of you know these are the people who just loved gaming and loved esports and wanted to make something more. But now with you know the way the landscape has changed, you know you have uh, more money coming in, you have more brands wanting to be involved, you have more games, you have more teams, you have more talent, and the level of the talent is just astronomical compared to what it used to be. Even when I was you know, trying to compete, uh, let's see, probably 10 years ago, it, it, it's just really exciting to see. So you, know, you, you look at an esports org nowadays, and it still has a lot of those old school, we're going to call it values, of being just people who are f- truly fans of the games and the esports, but there's also now the business side to it, which in a way helps provide more stability to the players. You know, back then when I was trying to compete in GoPro, um, so like 2009, you know, pro to me was seeing like a picture of Walshy on a poster at an MLG event. And I thought that was, you know, the dream. Whereas now, you know, being pro is actually being able to provide for yourself, for your family, have health insurance benefits, have 401ks and have a supporting work family all around you to help you achieve your goals. It's something I never could have dreamed of as as somebody competing back then. While we understand what an esports organization is, I think it starts to become interesting when we dive into why players would want to join an organization. Obviously, one like complexity makes complete sense. The, The name itself carries huge weight. But what other benefits are there for teams, players, and content creators that are signing up to an org? I think it's a lot of things. Uh, I think as a player, you know, trying to make a name for yourself is a big part of this industry. So, you know, your talent will definitely speak for itself, but you need a platform to be able to showcase your talent on. And so unless you're finding yourself on, on teams that are making waves in your game, being in an organization helps you have just another platform that's gonna help showcase you and grow that brand. So something that we do with all of our players is we give them opportunities both with, you know, potential partners and sponsors and just our own content to help them really grow and showcase themselves and help them build their own fan bases so that this career of gaming doesn't end when, you know, they're no longer the top player and the new young guns are coming up, but they have that platform so they can go on and be an influencer or a content creator or even just find another career within, you know, esports and gaming. I think that's some of the the perks that people don't really talk about or think about when joining an org. It's more than just having that guaranteed salary. I mean, obviously that's nice, but as a player, you want to look long-term and that's something that orgs like ourselves, Complexity, can really provide. So much like clans of old, you're joining an organization for a sense of community and support. The support includes the tools you need to succeed at the highest level and obviously there's a level of monetary support as well. It's a safety net more than anything, right? You get to focus on what you do best, competing or creating content, while the org does the rest to make sure you're able to do what you do best, best. But let's climb down the rabbit hole a little further. 
If you're a regular listener of this podcast, you've heard me say this so many times before, but I'm going to say it again. I come from a developing esports region. Much of the esports industry in regions like mine isn't commercialized, and a lot of the time, an organization is nothing like complexity. It's usually just one person with a rad logo and a Twitter account, and then that person is signing every team for every new potential title, and it just starts becoming a lot. So how does a successful organization like Complexity decide which game they plan to throw their support behind? So there's a lot of factors we look at. One would be you know, the health of the competitive scene for that game. So how big is the player base? Is it active? Are there a lot of content creators? Are there a lot of streamers? Are there a lot of you know, players that are being active and competing every day? Um, what's the viewership like of the game? Um, general, just that kind of ecosystem around the esport itself. And do we see potential in that game growing? Another aspect is looking at how invested the publishers are in supporting their esport. So a lot of times you'll see, you know, different uh, publishers using their esport in different ways. Some use it as a marketing tool. Others use it as um, just a way to really grow their game because they love esports. And some you do it just because they think that's the right move. And I, I think, you know, overall, the uh, investment into the esports ecosystem that the developers, that the publishers of the game have uh, kind of shows us, OK, these are they believe in their game. They believe in their title. They want to make this work. They want to have a successful eSport. That's something that we want to get behind because when we look at an eSport, we want to be looking at it for the long term. We don't want to just kind of hop in a game and then hop out if it doesn't look good. We want to get in. We want to get involved. We want to help it grow and help the team that we acquire or that we work with grow. And then also, you know, just from a competitive standpoint, looking at the caliber of players. You know, if we're entering into a game and a lot of the top talent is taken or signed to other orgs, we want to get trophies. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's always nice when you have a team that you know lifts a trophy in the name of complexity. So we look at seeing, you know, is there talent available, or even you know those kind of blossoming talent, like the players who are just on the cusp, and we think with our resources can really push through and be the next big thing. We do a really good job, uh, myself and some of the other management team here, looking at and scouting into these games. And then recruiting players and seeing if we can mold them into these, you know, top tier premier esports athletes. So, uh, and, and you can even see evidence of this, right? You can see it with Complexity GX3, um, a really strong women's roster in Valorant. Uh, you can see it with our Rocket League team, one of the, well, actually the best team out of South America. They they took the the risk and moved themselves to Mexico so that they compete in North America this season. And um, that's something that you know we wanted to get behind as complexity and really support them in that adventure. And now they've qualified for the major and we're, uh, we're heading to, uh, to Sweden. So um, there's obviously all of these different factors looking at esports from the outside, but uh, that's kind of the, I, I, I rambled on a little bit, but that's the gist of what we, we look at. I really loved how Nick broke that down and pinpointed some really poignant things to consider, including lifting trophies. While I'm on the bandwagon of what a professional organization should do, I, I thought it might be worthwhile to understand what a professional organization looks like as well. I, it's going to be too many for me to, to list, but you know, if you look at it from, I'll, I'll kind of start from the basics. You know, most teams have a coach or a manager, um, so somebody to kind of directly work with the players every single day and support them. And then you've got play, people like myself, um, like my boss, Soren. Uh, the, I'm the assistant general manager. Soren's the general manager. And we're kind of there to be the liaison between the teams and then every other department within complexity, like kind of we, I talked about earlier. The, we have a whole videography department who helps us plan and create content around our players to help promote them. Uh, we have a partnerships team who kind of do a lot of the business side. We have a sales team. Uh, we have the upper management and people like our CEO, Jason, our CEO, Kyle. We have, you know, in our facility, because we have a state-of-the-art facility, obviously we need IT people. So we have some IT people here who help make sure that, you know, when one of our teams comes into the building to practice or to train, they have the top of the line, newest computers or newest tech that they need in order to be successful. And then obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to expand because it's a, it's a growing industry and we're a growing company. And uh, so we just actually recently hired two new executives, uh, a head of sales, a head of marketing, and uh, three directors across partnerships and creative teams, like a video director. <laughs> I actually sit right next to him, but our director of um, 
of uh, graphics and graphic design and visual stuff, who's a long-term friend of mine. And, you know, we're still hiring. We have new posts um, on our on our website. So if you're interested, we are hiring. Hopefully by now you're starting to realize that this is far more than just a few friends with a logo. Complexity is a business entity built around the success and support of its players and content creators. It's by no means the only organization like this. The biggest and best in the world are, are much the same. And a typical day in the office working for a company like Complexity might actually not be what you think it is. A normal work day. Uh, so I try to come into the office during like the stereotypical work hours, you know, around 9, 930 till, you know, five to six. Uh, some nights it's later, you know, for example, just the other night I was here, uh, until probably seven thirty eight because I was watching our rocket league team and I was here with a bunch of our, uh, some of the people from game square, like the CEO of game square and, uh, our, our CEO of complexity. And we were all watching and supporting our rocket league team, which I think is really important. You know, even though it's a business and there are the business aspects, it's still kind of like you and I were talking about that, that old school just passion for games, passion for esports, uh, family vibe. And I think that's really important to keep in mind and remember as you're, you know, you're growing your org or you're growing your business in this industry. That's our roots. And it's important to stay kind of true to those roots. And the players know, you know, the players know and, and love the fact that I'm sitting there next to our CEO and they have the CEO watching them and cheering them on and getting excited every time they score in Rocket League. So that was a little bit of a tangent, but yeah, like I said, my, my day to day is uh, kind of average work hours, even though, you know, players can wake up late. Some of our apex players, uh, their sleep schedule, I'm going to call them out here a little bit, but not the best, but, you know, being able to make sure that I'm there to communicate with them, check in, uh, make sure they're ready for, you know, if they have an upcoming tournament or a pro league match, if they need anything and, and really just, you know, help make sure that all of those stresses that are outside of the game, all of those distractions aren't really there for them, that I'm taking care of them. So like I said, they can focus on achieving their goal, whether that be winning, whether that be growing their stream or growing their brand, they can focus on that. And I take care of all the other stuff. I think as esports has developed into what it is today versus the community battles in arcades years ago, it's also grown because new insights and knowledge has entered the space. In established businesses like Complexity, it's easy to see that it's just in the staff makeup because not everyone working and pushing for the success of Complexity is necessarily a gamer. I think that's one of the cool things about our industry is you don't necessarily have to be a gamer to love the games. Um, like when I was coaching, people would always say, how can you be a coach when you're not as good as your players or better than your players? And I was like, okay, well, just because my thumbs don't work as well as my players doesn't mean I don't have the understanding of the game or the knowledge of the game. And I think that's true for, you know, the business side of it, you know, just because somebody doesn't play every single night and isn't like a hardcore gamer doesn't mean they don't have an appreciation for the art form of gaming or just the community of gaming and are just really good at sales or really good at marketing. Um, I think as long as that understanding of, you know, this is something that people are passionate about and you can appreciate that passion, you can be successful in your role on the business side, even if it's not necessarily your direct cup of tea. But I do think, um, you know, playing games is a bonus because then you can chat about games of the workplace, which is always fun. I'm hoping by this point, Nick and myself have helped you understand how important organizations like Complexity are to the esports ecosystem, as well as the role they play for players and content creators. However, even if you're a hardcore esports fan, there are usually a host of misconceptions around organizations and their role. I think that there's a misconception that uh, people don't realize there's a lot of work that goes into being an esport competitor, to being one of these pro players. And I think that a lot of people draw this comparison between, you know, your professional Fortnite player or your professional Apex player and your professional NFL player or your professional, uh, you know, FIFA player or, or something along those lines, NBA. And while they're, I would look at them as both athletes, um, I think it's different types of athletes. And I think that the work that we do here um, through all of the wellness training and all of the, you know, other aspects prove that esports athletes respond to to their workloads with the same type of stress as a traditional athlete with the same type of strain as traditional athletes 
and it might not be you know their legs because they're not running up and down a, uh, a basketball court, but their their hands or their backs or you know their posture, all of these you know outside external health factors, you can draw the comparisons to a traditional athlete. So I think there's a misconception that you know gamers are you know just the kids in the mom's basement kind of thing, and that's definitely not true, especially at this top level. These players are putting in countless hours, you know, eight to ten hours a day to perfect their craft and to be the best they can. And it's highly competitive. You know, if you think about it, every single person who's played a video game, that's your competitor, whether it's directly, you know, they may not be in the same tournament, but, you know, maybe that that 13 year old kid who just got onto Apex. That's the next rising star that you have to stay better than or that you have to improve uh, or that forces you to improve. Sorry. So. I think that there's that misconception. And then I think people underestimate how much uh, emphasis organizations like ourselves, Complexity, put on player care. Um, you know, we invest not only the, the, the money, but the time and the energy into making sure that, you know, these players and these, these streamers and these content creators are truly taken care of and that they know that we're here to support them both through the triumphs and the trials and help them achieve those goals of theirs. And I know I keep saying that achieving their goals thing, but it's such a big personal mantra of mine and and it's a big mantra of complexity. It, you know, it's literally part of our mission statement. So the lengths that we go to to protect our athletes um, from the mental and physical stresses and pressures and making sure that they have a healthy work-life balance and access to all the resources they need, that's all you know, things that we're happy to do to help these players achieve their goals and to be successful in this industry. I've been partnered with Logitech G for two years now. They're the global leaders in esports and the gaming gear of choice for pro players all over the world. Some of the weapons in my arsenal include peripherals from their pro series of products. The Logitech G designers and engineers work directly with pro gaming athletes to understand what they need and then make them the best products possible. If you want to take your gaming to the next level, check out logitechg.com. Time for the juicy bits, or, or at least the bits I know most esports fans always want to know. How exactly does an organization like Complexity make money? Yeah, that's definitely the, the big question. <laughs> My parents ask me that all the time, actually. There's a lot of ways, honestly. Uh, I know that sounds very generic, and I can give you some, some a little bit more insight into that without going into you know, too much specifics. But there's a lot of ways to generate revenue in esports. When you field rosters and a lot of tournaments and a lot of different games, that's one way that you can grow the business and the brand. And then you can diversify your revenue sources through um, things like apparel, like, you know, merch sales, um, through streaming and creating content around the brand and around the players through, you know, products, you know, just general, uh, like if we wanted to develop our own keyboards or something like that, um, you've seen orgs do that in the past. Um, through consulting and helping other brands, maybe brands that aren't too familiar with gaming and, and esports as a whole, helping them get involved into this esports industry and this ecosystem where there are billions of dollars um, at stake. And then collaborations. So I think that you see uh, a lot of opportunities for orgs to find ways to create revenue. I think there's a little bit of creativity that has to go into it, but it's why you, it's kind of like there's different building blocks to this successful esports model. So having the teams and having the successful players and content creators grow the brand, which helps you be able to diversify those revenue streams that I just mentioned and make those individual things more successful. Like for example, the more fans that our Apex team has, the more sales we could drive in merch, for example, because you know fans want to support their team and support the the brand that they represent or support those players' individual brands, and then. You know, there's obviously the the partnerships and sponsorships aspect of it. You know, you see partner logos and sponsor logos on jerseys and on on you know even buildings. So uh, there's a lot of ways, and I don't want to bore too many people with the specifics, but um, it's a little bit of creativity and it's a little bit of you know growing your brand and making the right moves and being with the right people. While I was chatting to Nick, it actually got me thinking about prize money conversations I've heard in the past. So, so bear with me here, because for most esports fans, this seems like an obvious question, but I thought for new esports fans, it, it might be worthwhile to, to break this down a bit more. Playing professional esports usually means you're competing for cash. If you're signed to an organization, does that mean that they're getting the cash or, or is it a little bit more complex than that? 
no org that I know of, at least no org should take yeah. an entire prize money. Um, it definitely depends contract to contract. Um, it's part of it's it's one of the key negotiation points that players have uh, when they talk to an org. Like kind of the basics are like the salary, the the prize money split, and then things like travel or if there's any kind of in game assets that are branded for the team. Um, a lot of times, like orgs and and players will negotiate deals around that. So it, it really depends on the game. It depends on the team and the players. But most of the time, uh, the players keep a majority of their prize money, or they, that's what they should be negotiating for. In recent years, esports organizations have branched out. You, you've probably noticed both Nick and I constantly grouping esports players together with content creators. In, in a recent episode of Tech Call Talks, I actually chatted to Claire Siobhan about being a gaming content creator and what it takes. If you listen to that episode, you might be wondering how a gaming content creator finds themselves signed to an esports organization. Well, I think this this move has happened because a lot of times when you look at a game, right? Like, let's just take Apex, for example. Um, you can tell I'm an Apex fan and I play it too much because I keep bringing it up. Um, but you look at Apex, for example, the esports section of that community is just one section of it right because you have the youtubers and the people who create montages and the people who are streamers um both of those i guess technically count as content creators or the people who do tiktoks around it which is again content creators but different niches within that content creation umbrella these are all kind of different communities and then you have your casual players right you know uh, i get on and play casually and i'm not trying to be competitive i play ranked but i digress uh, so you have all of these different sub communities within the co overall community of that game apex. And I think by bringing on, uh, members to an organization like complexity, you know, we have our apex pro team and then having people like Ninjala, who's a content creator in apex or a Prizzy, who's a content creator in apex or Clara, who's a content creator in apex, having these other communities, their individual communities, but also just that content creation community involved and showing them, hey, look, we also have this cool esports side or even showing the esports side, you know, the, the diehard competitive fans. Hey, look, we have these really awesome personalities who also play this game that you love watching. You should check them out. I think being able to meld those communities together helps kind of diversify both the esports program and that audience, but also the content creation program and that audience because we all have this love for a game apex and that's true for every game out there we all have this love for this game so you know we have a massive group of content creators ranging from dota 2 to fortnite or like apex like i was talking about uh, a lot of you might be familiar with tim the tap man who we recently brought on board and he alone has 18 million people that he can reach across his various social medias so you know bringing him on board helps show his fans hey look at all the cool stuff we're doing across the board with complexity maybe you guys might like some of that and it'll show some of our fans who you know if they're under a rock and don't know who tim is hey look at this really funny awesome dude who plays warzone and all of these other games that are very similar to the games that you like because we know you like it. you watch us for some of these other games maybe you should check him out so it's this really awesome harmony um, of a relationship introducing the audiences together and then you know that kind of chains into helping uh, you know, esports organizations find new offerings that we can give to our fans and to, you know, potential brand partners through content. So, for example, you know, Tim, uh, he hosted a stream from the Dallas Cowboys Stadium and he was playing on the Jumbotron, like the massive, I think it's one of the biggest screens in, in the United States, if not the world, um, with Ezekiel Elliott, who actually is a professional football player and one of the best running backs in the NFL. And they're, they're both playing in this Cowboy Stadium because they have this love for the game together. And we're able to help create that opportunity because of that love for the game and by having people from different, you know, I guess, demographics come together to appreciate that love. So this, this uh, movement of, you know, esports, traditional esports organizations going into content creators and signing content creators is just the the next move to help grow esports but also grow the content creators because of that love for the game 
it's safe to say I, I think Nick has pretty much answered almost every question I've ever been asked or had myself about esports organizations and I'm hoping he's answered yours too. This is such a great resource for new players and a personal little anecdote here has made me an even bigger fan of complexity than I already was. GG Nick. There's one last thing that I think is important to cover though. If you are a professional or wannabe professional player and have been offered a contract by an organization, what are some of the factors you should be considering before signing? And, and what are the questions that you need to ask? I actually love this question. As I was getting my start in, in esports, this is something that I, I found so many players struggled with the not only the negotiations because you know it, it's it's kind of intimidating talking to people about you know potential potentially getting paid and you know your value and um, it's really hard to put some of those things into numbers it's awkward almost um, and and know honestly you know who's telling the truth and who's not uh, I think you know having been in those I, I like to call them the trenches um, as a as a coach and being on that you know more direct team side being somebody who is on the stage with the players and really close with the teams and the players and, and understanding those feelings and how tough that is. This is something that I, I love giving advice on. And so my advice would be first, look at the broader offer. Um, look at what that org is potentially providing you and how will it set you up for long-term success? Because if you think about it, if you're trying to be a professional player or a content creator, but more directly a professional player, um, there's kind of that like window of time where you're gonna be at your peak uh, in terms of performance, just like any traditional athlete. And so what are your goals to accomplish during that that peak time, you know, those years, your golden years? What, are, what is uh, your objective for that time and how can this org help you achieve that? And then also, how are they going to set you up for what's next? You know, are they going to help you transition into a traditional role in the business side? Are they going to help give you the tools to maybe look at marketing or, or, you know, some other thing that you're interested in? Or are they going to help set you up to be a content creator and help you build your brand so that you can actually use that um, like we've seen a lot of players do across various esports? Um, somebody like Shroud, who's in Counter-Strike and now is a content creator because he had the brand built up for him. And, and we've done the same thing with our, for example, our Fortnite player Punisher, um, who was a professional Fortnite player for us. And now he has a, a career as a content creator. So look at that long-term success. Uh, next piece would be look at how they've supported other players and athletes in the past. Maybe you know somebody who played for that team or know somebody who knows somebody who played for that team. But try to do your research and don't just jump into a decision because you see a dollar sign or you know, whatever currency is, is relevant to you. Um, look at you know, really the, the intangibles almost. Because how they treat, you know, other players are going to be honest and how they treat other players is going to circulate through a community and you want an org that doesn't have a bad reputation or a, you know, a, a bad history with anybody. And then that kind of segues into the last point, which is the org's reputation overall. I mean, do they have a successful track record in helping their players and their content creators grow? Do they have a successful brand themselves? And are you seeing that brand continue to grow? Are they doing a good job signing partners and sponsors and bringing new exciting opportunities for the people who are underneath the organization? These are all things that are pretty publicly available and it are pretty easy to look up and to do your research on. So if you have somebody, you know, if you're that talented player or that next, you know, growing content creator, and you get an offer, make sure you're looking at these things because it's it's super important that you don't just jump into the first opportunity. I know it's super exciting. I remember my very first offer and, you know, in hindsight, there's definitely more that I could have done and more research that I could have uh, educated myself with. So take the time, consider the option. And if an org is is really wanting to invest in you and your success, they'll be patient and let you do the research and be open to answering any questions you have. You've been listening to Take All Talks, a playlist original podcast series focusing on the gaming and esports industries. My name is Sam Take All Right, and I write, produce, and host these shows. If you have any feedback or just want to chat, be sure to find me on Twitter or Instagram at TakeAllZA.